You're listening to All Things 3D, where we talk about the world of fabricating, designing, and capturing in the third dimension. Hey, everybody. Mike, where are you? Are you in Toronto? You got a face not spoiled by beauty. I have some scars from where I've been. You got eyes that can see right through me. You're not afraid of anything they've seen. I was told that I would feel nothing the first time. I don't know how these cuts feel, but in you, I found the light. If there is a light, you can't always see, and there is a world, we can't always be. If there is a dark, that we should Hey, doubt. Mike, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. I couldn't hear you. So, uh, uh, sitting in between a, a U2 concert. Uh, that's what it makes you feel like. Actually, it's more than that. They're transitioning to different people around the world. I can't hear you. You gotta turn the music off. There you are. There. How's that? That's better. Okay, so these are people from around the world that are part of this video. And uh, they're obviously continuing to sing the song, and I can't actually hear the song myself. And uh, here's somebody from India. But what's funny is that you can go around and look inside wherever they staged this at and look at all the neat things, and then we transition back to Bono there. Very interesting. Where can you find this demo? Well, this is from a company called VRSE. You know, we've talked about them before. They have a series of videos. In fact, they're the ones that were behind the production of the video that was seen, uh, I guess, worldwide. Remember the thing that was brought out by New York Times? They sent out yep. over a million Google Cardboards. But they're the company behind that. So the question I have, is this going to be the next, what do you want to call it, MTV style? You know, before we had video, which kind of brought music back into the fold. Are we going to see this more in the VR now? I've already listened. To, well, I kind of like you too. A lot of people don't, but uh, there's a couple of other v music videos out there, some with some CG stuff. But I really like this because one, it's live action, uh, and they they really put a lot of work into the settings. Definitely, it's uh, so very uh, yeah. very immersive. Extremely immersive. Wow. And as you look around, you know, I'm positioning myself here, but uh, as you look around, you can see a whole lot of different things. So, <laughs> pretty wow. cool. Yeah, very cool. Hey. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome. It's uh, another episode of All Things 3D. Today is December 4th, 2015, and uh, it's Friday. It's, a, it's our week in review. We've been, uh, I've been gone. How's everything? You have been. been? Yeah. You have been adopted by hobbits, I remember. By quite hobbits, quite. yep. So, uh, so well, we should jump right into it. Yes, you got to get going. So um, <laughs> we'll move into it. So let's go right into um, our two guests. You know, I was doing a little bit of searching, and I'll jump out to my website here. Um, how to fix a broken wolf skull? Well, I've got too many wolves. If you don't know, actually, they're uh, Alaskan klekais, but they look a lot like wolves. So I was interested <laughs> in this. Um, and I, I noticed the tools they were using, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, are they things that you school, did they? <laughs> I don't know, but we'll ask them in a moment. But uh, the point is, this was actually done from the Idaho Visualization Lab, uh, which is located at the Idaho um, Museum of Natural History. And I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool to have them on to actually talk about it themselves? So we actually do. So let me introduce to you Robert and Rebecca. So kind Welcome of tell us program. a little about yourselves. Why are well, you in Idaho? Why or how is it in Idaho? <laughs> Both. Uh, well, my name is uh, Becky Hansis O'Neill. I'm the Education Specialist for the Idaho Museum of Natural History. And I I'm here because I like Idaho. I like doing outdoor stuff. 
And my name is Robert Schlater, and I am the manager of the Idaho Virtualization Laboratory. And we're here because 14 years ago, one of our old directors wrote a grant to start digitizing things in our collections. And so that's when we started, and we're still here, still doing digitization of various different things. Okay, now you mentioned digitization. So um, one of the things I noticed in a lot of the and I actually, I guess, what do they say, dropped the lead already, but uh, essentially you have an acronym called IVL, and I think I've already identified what that means, but why don't you kind of tell us what that is. You mentioned digitization, so we'll get into that in a minute, but uh, the V in IVL stands for virtualization, is that correct? Yes, it does. Uh, so it, tell us a little bit more about this. I mean, it well, appears it's kind of a made-up word. Um, if you're big into computer science, virtualization means making multiple machines look like one machine. So making thousands of servers look like a single server. For us, it means taking physical things and making them digital. Essentially turning something from the physical world into a file you can manipulate on your computer. And that comes from using flatbed scanners to scan text, digital cameras to take photographs, or in our case, using lasers and structured light systems to make 3D models of things. So let's go right into it. You said you use, uh, obviously, uh, a multiple of 3D scanning technologies. Uh, mm -hmm. What in general? Can you identify some of the names behind them? Uh, well, the first ones we bought were from a company called Cyberware, which no longer exists. They went out of business about five years ago. Um, we still have one of those that you can see in the background here, this black box with the castle on it. Hmm. It's a desktop 3D scanner from Cyberware. We also have two Konica Minolta Vivid 9i box scanners. Those use a turntable and a laser. We have two Ferro Edge arms with laser line probes. We have a Ferro Focus LiDAR scanner and a Creoform GoScan 50, which we use. And then we've got a lot of cameras and some software. We do photogrammetry and stuff like that, too. So we pretty much cover digitization in almost every way. We don't have a CT machine. We do work with hospitals when we need CT done, so we can handle computer tomography stuff as well. We process a lot of CT data. Yes. You, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, is it Rebecca or Becky? What would you like to go by? Either one. Becky's okay. the supporter. Um, okay. But we do a lot of CT data processing. Uh, for, the, for, the, for the hospitals themselves? Uh, no, we no. send things to hospitals to have them scanned, or people will take them and have them scanned, and then we process that into oh, okay. models of things. Okay. And you guys are basically preserving uh, artifacts uh, uh, for uh, historical of historical significance for a museum, or um, what yeah. was the grant initially intended for? Well, the grant initially, because the director that was responsible for writing it, she and her husband were both paleontologists, and they went down into our paleontology collection and looked at a fairly significant um, collection of Ice Age mammals that's degenerating and destabilizing quickly because it's not quite completely fossilized and yet it's not still bone so it comes apart and it breaks apart quickly and so their thought was is we need to preserve what we've got in place now so that in the future people can still see it and do research on it and that type of stuff and we then branched out into more than just those types of damaged specimens very cool. You know, what was it, about three months, three months ago we had the Smithsonian on uh, when they were scanning the uh, Apollo, what was it, Apollo 11 spacesuit, if I remember correctly, in order to yes. preserve it in a 3D. I'm still waiting for my 3D model from that. Uh, I backed <laughs> them on Kickstarter, but uh, they were very interesting. And they did a, basically a lot of things you do. You seem to be well funded. I mean, you've mentioned some fairly pricey uh, 3D scanners, or at least for me, they're pretty pricey. Uh, pretty so you pricey. get to play with some some cool tools uh, tools there. Um, How so many artifacts do you scan uh, per day, would you say? <sighs> That's an interesting question, because it depends on what we're working on. 
So, for example, the majority of the things that we scan are bottle materials. So we're talking about skeletons of animals. And if you've got a highly experienced person doing the work, they can go through two to three hundred a day. Someone who's not very experienced, you may get two or three. You know, it just depends. It also depends on the scanner you're using. Some of them are slow acquisition times. Some of them are very rapid acquisition times. For example, the LiDAR device, if you want to go with a really high resolution scan, that's a two and a half hour long wait time per scan pass. And you're definitely going to want to do multiple positions on something. For the Faro Edge arms, each pass may only be a couple of seconds. But you're going to do hundreds of them over a larger object, mainly have 10 or 15 on a small one. So. And you obviously are, are working in the public sector, uh, you know, with grant money, if I understand correctly. But I'm of it, yes. do you, do, are you doing work for the private sector as well? Like, uh, do you guys offer private scanning services? Yes, we do. Um, we actually have to charge a different rate between educational and private sector. Um, strangely enough, it's still significantly less than what you would get if you were going to one of the large engineering firms or something along those lines. Because we, by law, aren't allowed to charge the types of markups that they are. Because we are already, our overhead is basically already covered, and so by law we can only charge a certain amount for that. So it's still so, um, so you guys are, uh, uh, you offer uh, scanning services to the to the general public, yes, and you have and you and you work with uh, quite a few clients that way. A few, Very cool. yes. a few, awesome. So that's going to lead right into the next item, which we had a, a little short uh, response back and forth, and that is uh, augmented reality. How do you plan to introduce this? I mean, you know, one thing is to obtain the digital content, which obviously you guys are experts at, but now you're wanting to be able to use augmented reality, I'm assuming within the library itself, my library, I'm sorry, the museum itself, so that the I, I'm assuming people can on some type of headset or a viewer of some sort and see something in front of them as though it had actually existed on the floor to begin with. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. Becky's well, nodding her head. So, uh, well, that's go ahead, the, Becky. The education aspect comes in. So I started working here a year and a half ago, and I really wanted to integrate what the virtualization lab was doing with education that was having kind of a hard time. And very rapidly, AR and VR are becoming more and more accessible by the month, almost. <laughs> So well, our plan is to take our models, create an app using uh, Unity, and let people you can download the app for free on your phone, and then you get to see extra content. So sometimes that's artifacts that we can't keep on display for their own safety. Sometimes that's things that we scan, but maybe they live at a different institution. So we essentially get to double our gallery space. Um, and we're also in the process of exploring 360-degree video and then in that case, you would have a, a little headset. So, for example, if you had an exhibit on skiing, why not have a virtual ski run or the history of skiing or something like that? We, we live in a skiing state. So we plan to tr start implementing these as much as we can in the next year, year and a half. Uh, well, that's pretty exciting, and another reason I was intrigued by it is, as I mentioned in my email, I just started a Kickstarter. Uh, to develop kind of a, a kid's version of a VR viewer, more for the IPD of their eyes. And mm -hmm. one of my uh, demo video, or Unity, uh, what do you want to call it, simulators, is actually called Alps, and you do get to ski. Um, I have a product, and one of the things I mentioned called, uh, I call it EAVR, which is Environmental uh, Awareness Virtual Reality, which allows you to use the structure sensor to actually move around in it. Great. So, uh, getting back to, uh, you, I guess there's an acronym called VZAP as well, so I want to talk about that, but before we jump off the augmented reality, now, is this only available in your museum, or will this be available for anybody to download and enjoy, even if they haven't visited your museum? Yep, so there's a few different ways you can do that. <clears throat> um, so they can download our free app, and as long as they can also download and print our target images from our website, they can look up these things at home. So whatever we choose to make available. Um, so that's 
it's not hard. People would be able to do that at home. Um, we're also looking at other products like flipbooks. It's basically a book with an image and maybe a little bit of text, and on each page you'd have an augmented reality model or possibly even video or audio going along with it. And so as long as you've got the book and the app, which of course would come with the book or be free for download, you can then look at whatever you want. And Very we're nice. also looking into developing a Unity package that will allow other museums to quickly just take their content and put it in and develop it that way. Well, I think that's excellent. And obviously, we seem to be traveling on parallel paths there because that is my goal as well to provide educational uh, more in the medical. I have two that I'm coming out with. One is called OR Surgery, which is about done which allows you to literally walk around in a surgical room, and the other one uh, is an MRI simulator. Um, so, uh, yes, it, well, obviously it's very exciting. So did we talk about VSAP? VSAP? Okay. So let's talk about that, and then I'll let Chris have the last word, and then uh, we'll move on so that Chris can get out of here. So, uh, uh, so uh, VSAP. Uh, VSAP is an acronym for the Virtual Zooarchaeology of the Arctic which was a very large multi-part NSF grant that we got close to eight years ago that is now done, it's complete, it's finished, so we have to now go back and rebuild the website because we built it in Silverlight and Microsoft has stopped supporting Silverlight, all of the browsers have stopped supporting it, so we have to figure out how we're going to convert it. Just say That's no to proprietary. <laughs> but um, essentially what it was is we had a guy here at ISU who's a postdoc who was working with one of our archaeologists in the Arctic and he's a faunal analyst and he was being severely frustrated by the fact that he didn't have access to a comparative collection for the faunal material that would let him identify what they were finding in the excavation. And so we partnered with them and said, hey, if we can get loans of the material, we can scan them, we can put them into a database, we can let people look at it. And after a nine-month uh, test period where we got some money from all the programs at NSF to basically do a proof of concept, we then got a multi-million, multi-year grant to go ahead and digitize as many species as we could from the Arctic for fish, mammals, and birds. And to be absolutely honest, we didn't get through it because one, you can't find everything that existed in the past because there's a lot of extinct things that were being used in the past that don't exist in collections anywhere in the world. And then in order to do a fauna collection correctly, you need fetal, yearling, young adult, or I should say sub-adult, adult, male, female, and multiple species specimens per species, and we're lucky that we even got one of some of the species that we did. We have some that are complete, some that are incomplete, and it's all available right now online for free, and anyone in the world can look at it, and we actually have at least six institutions that are using it as part of their faunal analysis training programs across the world which is really nice for us. We just have Very to cool. out how to make the Silverlight stuff not Silverlight. <laughs> which, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, well I was, I'd ask some questions, but uh, I'll let Chris have the last one, and then uh, we'll move on. But you know, from my standpoint, thank you both for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, keep up. I, obviously, I don't need to say this, but keep up the great work. I'm going to go down. One of the questions before I let it go to Chris is, uh, are these available to download as actual 3D files so if people wanted to print them? Um, unfortunately, no. Okay. And it's because we don't actually own the materials. Most of the things that we've scanned as far as VZAP is concerned are owned by other institutions, federal and state entities, and we wanted originally to make them all available for download for everyone, but very rapidly people started saying, whoa, 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 hold on, yeah. wait, 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 wait. And so now they're available to view on a website, and if you want access to them specifically for things like downloading and printing, you have to make a request, and the request has to go through the repository standard request mechanism, 
and we have had people across the globe basically say, hey, I'd love to print a, in this case, I'm going to pick Walrus, because that's one of the more famous ones that we've got. And we then pass that request on to the people, in this case, at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks, where we scan our Walrus material. And they then either approve it or deny it or work with them to make what they want to happen. And we're hoping in the future to go back and revisit all of those agreements that we had so that we can make all of the materials available for download in the future. Because now it's actually starting to happen and people are starting to understand what it means. While eight years ago when we were working on starting all this, nobody knew what it meant, nobody knew where it was going to go. It was all about, it's our stuff, you can't have it. And now it's all about, it's yeah, this is a great it's way to get our stuff out there. So. It's a really interesting. Uh, it's uh, we've we've actually we had a, a another guest who was from uh, Mike. You'll have to refresh me. I think is I think it was Arc. Yeah, was the it company. Was and they and they three D scanned Mount Rushmore, right? So mm -hmm. it's public property. So so I know quite a bit about public domain law, and I am a, a, appreciate uh, the public domain, and I'm I. I Totally, I love the whole Creative Commons, what they've done to expand beyond public domain. And I think it's really interesting because if you look at public domain law, where it is, if it's publicly funded, which in, the, in your case you are, yeah. it's coming from a public institution, there's actually – public domain law is protecting you in this case. It actually would demand that you publish these things, right? Like if, if, a, if a piece of artwork is commissioned for a stamp, let's say, it's paid for by tax dollars, it's automatically in the public domain. So all of the files you have technically are in the public domain. It's just weird how they get caught in this uh, bureaucratic red tape uh, kind of like no man's land because yes. he was explaining the same thing. I mean a 3D scan that's paid for by us or by federal tax dollars of Mount Rush Rushmore, which is a public uh, national park, mm -hmm. but he can't, it's illegal, or they're claiming, the, the, uh, the bureaucracy's claiming is illegal for him to publish, and they're totally out of their mind. So I think, I think what we're going to start to see is we're going to start to see like maybe some Freedom of Information Act requests or something along those lines where people start to demand that these files are released to the general awesome. public. Because I think it's I think it's a shame that they're not available. Hey, hey, Chris, to I don't know if you remember this, but the the scan of the Mount Rushmore was a little unique and strange. Is that it was actually funded by the, uh, Irish. the Danish government, the Danish government, or something like that. <laughs> so, and that's one of the reasons. No, no, why no. no. It, it, it was an Irish company that had hired them, but they were using federal tax dollars or some. But it was this. It, it it's was, this weird. Uh, I don't know. It was just a weird. Uh, Convoluted process. Very convoluted yeah. process, and I think that it's a shame. Like, I mean, the whole point of you guys getting this grant money is to make the information public and preserve the information, right? So, I, I uh, you know, I, I hope that one day there's an easier process to kind of right. uh, open these files up to everybody. Well, there's actually an interesting series of things that are going on right now across the country, and bringing up the whole federal saying it's a legal thing is what sparked my mind to think of it. And that is that two years ago, President Obama basically told the Department of the Interior that you have repositories of federal items which are owned by the people scattered across the United States and you've locked the doors. You need to open them. And one way to open them is through digitization projects like this and free and open access for the public because it's their material. And now what is holding a lot of this up is bureaucratic red tape within the various divisions of the Department of the Interior where they try to figure out what does that mean? Because his statement was at you know, a 50,000, 100,000 foot level and they have to figure out the various nuts and bolts of what it means to actually do that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's like, where's the, what, what is the holdup, you know? It's like, where is the, I just don't well, see the disconnect at all. It either well, is public also, domain or it's not, you know? It just doesn't make any sense that it's not. Well, uh, we've the, already established time and time again it is. Right? Huh? Part of the holdup is they, 
the federal agencies are required by law to track how the material is being used. Right. So if I let you download something, you have to essentially confirm with whichever federal agency that technically is being held by um, that you're going to use it only for certain things and not for others. For example, one of our big things is everything that we do has to be not-for-profit, educational use only. And once we let somebody download it, how do we ensure that you don't then give it to someone else who starts selling it? But that defies public domain law because public exactly. domain law, if you have a piece of art that was that was commissioned in the public domain, I can take that piece of art, put it on a t-shirt, and sell it for profit, and that's totally legal. So I'm, I, I, I just fail to see how how it, it would be your responsibility to control how the public uses it if it's in well, it's either in the public domain or it's not. Well, I'm, I just I'm find have it to it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you said ten o'clock, and we're not going to get to anything else. Uh, so, I know. Sorry. Um, it's well, an interesting topic. I love I love talking about it, especially if you guys are on the front lines. You know, sharing the information. Um, I I uh, I look forward to uh, if if we find. Um, we're always looking for these repositories. It sounds like you guys are in the middle of rebuilding your uh, your repository, and uh, mm -hmm. if we come across one, we'll, we'd definitely love to reconnect with you guys. Uh, well, uh, yeah, just send me an email at any time. We'll go ahead and um, send. Actually, go ahead and send me some email with some links, and I'll make sure they're in the show notes today. And yep. uh, also, if anything else comes up, and I'd love to see what you guys do with the augmented, and if you start moving into virtual, and then I'll send you an email on this stuff if you're interested in actually trying out the structure sensor, uh, which is very reasonable in price. You're probably aware of that. Uh, and I, uh, there's some headsets out there, including the ones that I have designed and sell, uh, that allow you to do that. Not trying to promote myself here, but uh, they're the only ones available right now. But uh, uh, there are some other people coming out with things. Obviously, HoloLens uh, is really pushing into the educational realms, and maybe you've actually got something uh, going in that area as well. Uh, but on that note, let's kind of move on. Chris, thank you again, Robert and Becky. Thanks for coming uh, on the program. Appreciate it. Great talking to you. And That's Yes, great. Idaho is a beautiful area, and uh, I know why you guys are there. And obviously... <laughs> Right in the middle of a museum is a dream for a lot of people. Yeah. So if I head up that in that area, we actually have a friend up there. So we'll find a reason to actually come to the museum and maybe see you in person. So thank you very much. Okay, so you're welcome to stay with the show or drop out. It doesn't matter. Give us an Irish goodbye if you want, and then we'll move on. All right, Chris, go into your news item, please. All right. Well, Toshiba enters the metal 3D printing with a machine 10 times faster than the competitors. This is according to fortune.com, and uh, here's the article here, and uh, they apparently are working on a machine that they're claiming, this is Toshiba, as in the big Toshiba, and uh, they're claiming they have a, a printer that can print titanium and stainless steel that could Chris, be available. Your, at your screen's um, froze on my end just with your face, uh, oh. so I don't... Burp, 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 burp. <laughs> How so, about now? No. Nope. Still you. Nothing. Okay, now you're good. Now I see it. Okay. Uh, here it is. Machine uh, available as early as 2017, they're saying. Ten times faster at printing uh, stainless steel and titanium, uh, according to fortune.com. So uh, it can fabricate at up to 110 cubic centimeters per hour, according to a press release. Let's check this press release out at Toshiba.co.jp, and uh, that's what they're claiming. So, uh, again, it's kind of hearsay when it's a press release from the company manufacturing the technology, but uh, pretty cool story nonetheless. Yeah, and one of the reasons they say that they can go faster is they normally you center a whole layer. They're centering in tandem. Uh, which allows them to accelerate the process, but they said there may be some issues with the materials that they can use. All right, well, I'm going to move on to my item, and Apple's in the news again. It, and I love to talk about this because they seem to patent everything, and they always seem to have these really, really basic 
ideas that they're patenting and they must have somebody that they purchased in the patent office that's all I can say so this is their new idea and actually it's funny the person who wrote the article and I'll get down to it but essentially it is using inkjet technology to spray the 3D item with color I think <laughs> I talked about that before they did so can I go get a patent um, however, this is kind of funny. There's a rep rap where somebody used <laughs> magic markers, sharpie pens to create color, and I thought that was kind of a funny analogy and comparison. That uh, hey, you're not doing anything different here. And uh, so here we go again. Apple with their very basic patent process, pushing into something that uh, they may never actually design, but obviously building their portfolio for what reason? I don't know. Um, they do talk about these other people that are involved with it and they mention HP as being a leader. We both know that they don't have a color 3D printer. The ones that do is 3D Systems Projects as well as um, using the Z-Core technology and the M-Core which we've talked about several times as being the leaders in this area. So yeah, it's a very vague uh, article because it's a very vague patent. So, there you go. <laughs> okay, on the next item, Chris. Okay, and this will be my last news item for the day since I got to run here. Um, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you do your do this and go right into your print whisper and then I'll just carry the rest of the show after that. You got it. Okay, so Jay Leno apparently um, this is according to uh, according to one of our favorite websites here is uh, 3dears.org. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Jay Leno takes lo the local motor's 3D printed car for a spin on national TV. I look for a video of this to try to find a uh, video, but I don't think it's aired yet, so they just have mm. screenshots. But there's the Stratty Jay Leno uh, running around in the local motor's little 3D printed car. It's a pretty cool car. Uh, local motor's also makes uh, some really awesome high-end kind of rally cars. They have that rally raid car. Have you seen that thing? Awesome. But mm. uh, here's Jay Leno apparently trying to break the fender with a hammer and uh, they uh, they built that car in 24 hours. 3D printed wow. it. Yeah, so uh, we've covered so the car. They, yeah, go ahead. Did they actually print it uh, in his shop? Yeah, they have a printer. Um, they have a, a an actual printer, big printer that can print and it prints like a huge contour uh, and uh, they're saying that it's going to go on sale for 53 grand next year and uh, Jay Leno takes it for a spin on the show so we'll look out for that and hopefully show a little clip of it maybe next week Very good, yeah I'd like to see more of that. Okay well Chris, you've got a print whisper today I you know, do and uh, you know <laughs> Oh, is this your print whisper? <laughs> this is this is little Matthias. If you don't know Matthias, you got to go uh, type into YouTube Matthias Linda. That's all you have to type in. And uh, this is little Matthias. And Linda, Linda, he says, Linda, look and listen. And uh, the reason why I bring Matthias up is because uh, my print whisper tip of the day is Linda.com. One of my favorite places is uh, Linda.com. I hang out there. Constantly, they've just got, um, they've really expanded their catalog of learning um, tools, uh, learning videos. They've got a really awesome app for the iPad, iPhone. So if, if I'm at the gym, uh, I'll keep my headphones on. And, you know, usually you're either tuning out in your tunes or your podcast or whatever. But Linda is another thing you can, if you're jamming on the treadmill or you're jamming on your elliptical machine or whatever, and, and uh, might as well be learning too. So, um, they've got some great uh, uh, SolidWorks courses that uh, you can kind of piecemeal little parts off if you want. They're, everything's got subtitles, um, you know, or if you're on a plane, it's it's just a really good resource for me. They, they've got, it's not just for 3D modeling programs, but for pretty much any computer program you can think of, they've got a course on. And then they've also got a great uh, business resources like uh, uh, learning about management and uh, business business development. And uh, it's just a really good resource. It's it's a paid for resource. We're not sponsored by lynda.com. I wish we were. Yeah, I about um, to say lynda.com, if you're listening, we could really do more for you than these other shows like Twit. 
Hey, you're probably paying them an arm load. I mentioned to this Chris in the notes before we started, hey, we're giving them free promotions here. But you have a point there. The other point that I would like to make, Chris, this isn't free, right? It's uh, not there, free. Cost. Yeah, but it is it is worth it to me. It's worth it. Um, well, I'm, I'm on cost? here almost every day. I think it's uh, about 20 bucks a month for uh, their premium, something like that. That's but, not bad. No, it's not. It, and they have exercise files you can download, and uh, it's just a really, it's really useful, um, especially if you're if you want to learn. And you don't have to keep your subscription going. You don't have to do annual. If you want to set aside maybe a month or two that you're gonna just really buckle down and and uh, apply yourself, then then just uh, stick it out for a month or two, and maybe twenty or forty bucks will get you get you what you need and then you can turn off your membership, suspend it and turn it back on. Uh, for me, they just have so many courses that I just keep it on all the time. I'm always visiting the website, always checking something out, leaving it running, you know, in conjunction, like I said, with my podcast and all that. So that's my print whisperer tip of the day. All right, Chris. Well, if you can hang on there, I'm going to jump around a little bit. I'm going to bring back up the, uh, the Star Wars VR demo just for you because you know we, I, I hate for you to leave today without seeing this so I'm gonna go ahead and bring it up and uh, you know I think you'll enjoy it except I've lost my connection uh, airplay all right we should be back So Disney teamed up with Verizon hmm, to create this little cool thing. And what you can do is, uh, where's the video at? Uh, um, you can bring in stuff. And one of the things that they have is uh, some virtual reality stuff. And here we go. Maybe this is the brand new one. Uh, can you see it behind me? Yeah. See what this is. Oh, this is the augmented. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that there for a second. Um, okay, let's put that. Go back into the demo. Sorry if my. Here we go. Okay, this is kind of fun. All right, tells you to check your safety. Right. And well, the new ones are out, so we, you got to go, but I guess I'll enjoy it by myself. All right, here we go. Everybody out there? He has already left me. So this is the new demo um, put out by Disney and Verizon. It's a series of VRs. And I think they're coming out with one every 24 hours. And, uh, this is the first one. They're very quick. In fact, it's like, oh, I would like more. So I don't know if you can see me there, but uh, essentially I am using the new uh, Neody VR Play. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But uh, essentially... You can use Google Cardboard, and I should be coming here in a moment. There it is. There's the Millennium Falcon. It's coming in. There it is. And the little Bebop is going to come down and visit. So that's about it. That's all you get to see. And then you can continue to play it. Uh, Obviously, he's going to be another little funny R2-D2 type character. But for this episode, let's go back into downloading the next one. I haven't even seen this yet, so let's see what we've got here. Um, it's downloading now. Downloading. It's downloading again. Uh, so let's see what this one is. So I guess they're all titled Jakku Spy, and uh, I don't know if we know who that is in the movie or not. 
I know that some of you out there probably do. So let's play the next one here. So this just came out minutes ago, minutes ago. And again, these are Google Cardboard compatible. Oh, look at this. Oh, how funny. This is the one that uh, Industrial Light Magic was using in, uh, in the demo that they had on YouTube that uh, my friends over at Occipital, look, there we go, was using the uh, their device. I'm hoping that they, there, there he is. Let's see. The sad thing is I have little, no mobility. There he is. Can you see him there? <laughs> so that wasn't much, but I'll have to look at it later. So pretty cool. Um, obviously, little snippets uh, from the Industrial Light Magic Labs. Uh, we talked about them before, and uh, obviously, this is their works here. Uh, I am hoping that uh, they will release their, as I call it, the Environmental uh, Awareness Virtual Lab or uh, Virtual geez, Reality that allows you to literally walk around within these areas. Um, wouldn't it be kind of cool to be actually on a set? So pretty neat. I guess it went ahead and replayed again. So one more scene for you to enjoy. And I'll just terminate that. And I'll get right into, I'll come back to that, into my next news item. So a little break there with some Star Wars news. And uh, that is into the Washington University of St. Louis um, has figured a way to use the Xbox gaming technology, as we know it, as the Connect, and this was the original Connect, to scan uh, a person before they're getting an X-ray to determine their density, their size, so that would determine how much of a dosage they require. And uh, obviously, very low tech, but uh, using some proprietary. Uh, software, and I'm assuming it's the interface to provide them the information uh, that gets fed back into the x-ray system. Uh, that is what they're using. Uh, it was a grant. They're taking that grant and now going to be using the Connect 2. My only questions are the Connect 1 and the Connect 2 use two different technologies. Um, so I'm wondering how well it will adapt with the uh, Connect 2. Uh, I do know that from people who have mentioned it to me that the the ability to capture motion is better, but the density of the mesh files um, leaves something to be desired. And uh, so obviously we'll see, but uh, pretty cool. And again, um, you know, more technology that uh, has been available a little while. It's inexpensive finding more and more uses. And so that's really, really neat. So on, uh, we'll go on to my next item. We're gonna try to jump back. Um, Let's see if I can, I don't know if I'll be able to bring it up. Uh, let's see. Yeah, good. It'll show up. Uh, this is the program that caught my attention from the article uh, from the Idaho National Museum. And this is a program called SculptGL. It is something that you can use in your Chrome browser or anything that is WebGL compatible. But I think this is a Chrome app. But essentially, it has the look and feel of a program called, if I remember correctly, Sculptress, uh, the same people that make ZBrush. And what you can do is, like Sculptress, you can organically deform objects, as you can see here, um, by modifying your brush. Uh, you can increase or decrease the resolution um, I haven't played with a lot, but uh, the I guess the real cool thing is that this thing is available in a browser. And I'm going to see if I can expand this. Yeah, good. Um, so you can ex use this in your Chrome browser. And it seems to be fairly fluid, which I think is pretty cool. So let's see. I'm going to increase the resolution or the radius of my brush. There we go. And uh, I'm using my right mouse button to control the rotation. You press your middle mouse button and you can uh, scroll or pan the object. And then the scroll wheel allows you to zoom in and out. So it's you know very common with a lot of 3D applications. You can increase the density. I'm gonna make it a smaller brush. Okay, and I'm assuming, let's see if this works. Yep, oh, it just, okay. So if you hold the control key down, you get color. 
Let's see what happens if I hit the Alt key. Okay, so if you hit the Alt key, it creates a negative impression. So no keys, positive. Alt key, negative, and then Control key provides uh, painting. And then let's see what the Shift key does. Oh, looks like a blurring effect, uh, so or a smoothing effect. So actually, I think I really like. I'm going to play with this more, but uh, uh, <laughs> make a little snowman. Um, well, obviously, I'm not going to take any more time. Yeah, you can uh, play with it yourself. But it looks like a neat little program. It comes out of the Google Labs and uh, allows you to do organic modeling. And then I guess you can save it yep, as a PLY or an STL or an OBJ. So very, very cool. Or in its native format. All right, so back on to the next news item. And what do we have here? Um, yeah, this one's kind of interesting. This was from MIT, and this is their paper, and this was written somewhere else, but I thought I'd go into it a little bit. But essentially, they're talking about using uh, something like the Kinect or structured sensor, but uh, structure light uh, scanning processes, uh, but increasing the resolution of the structured light by using polarization. So I've kind of gone through there. Uh, this is a fairly thorough uh, paper, has a lot of the, the mathematics involved, but they're showing you here. Let me see if I can uh, zoom in on this a little bit. Uh, but as you can see here, the thing about um, polarization is you can discern uh, the phase of the particular signal. So I'm assuming what can be done here is by using, and there they show it, let's see if I can using a camera uh, outside of the connect in order to provide the, the phased information of the light source. And uh, by doing so, they can obviously provide more information than can normally be received by the connect by itself. Um, obviously, there's a lot of thorough math here, uh, but it doesn't look insurmountable. And then it actually gives you a lot of different results. So I'm really looking at possibly using this myself. Since it seems to be a public paper, I'll have to see how many patents have been filed with it. Uh, but uh, it would be very interesting. As you know, I have a lens system called Four Eyes, but I'm going to replace one of those lenses uh, with a polarized lens and then uh, create a uh, maybe use Mesh Lab, not Mesh Lab, uh, Math Lab or something to. Uh, uh, run some of the the information that I obtain uh, from my application and see what I can do with it. Uh, it would be pretty cool to use the occipital structure sensor with this. So there you go. If somebody out there has moved forward with this and uh, would like me to uh, work my four eyes lens system uh, into something that they can use uh, that's portable, let me know. Love to talk to somebody about it. But here's some examples of what you would get from the connect uh, with shading enhancement and then polarization excuse me polarization enhancement and uh, so as you can see there uh, with the shading enhancement you get detail but uh, you also get noise with the polarization there appears to be less noise uh, some of the difficulties still ahead is uh, I guess there's some artifacting that need to be corrected from the um, the disparity between the uh, the different polarization um, images as they're shown here. Uh, so there's some correction processes that still need to, to take place. But uh, it's a great article. It will be in the show notes so that you can head out if you're interested in this type of thing. Uh, if you are working on something like that already, contact me. I'd love to have you on and do an interview with you. But uh, yeah, really neat stuff there. So that is my scanning darkly section. So right now I'm going to go into VR. And we kind of talked about the Star Wars experience. And here's the actual uh, website. So uh, experience Star Wars like you never before and Jakku Spy. So essentially they have cardboard. But as mentioned, I have a new little product that I have been working on. Actually, I have released the STLs. Uh, out on you imagine and i call this the uh, neodvr play p-l-a lowercase y 
Why? Because the material I'm hoping that people print this in would be PLA. So play. Um, so essentially the ILM X labs, we've talked about them before. I've hoped to have them on. They seem to be ignoring me, but uh, I would like to have them on. They're obviously using a lot of tools, including the occipital structure sensor uh, to create some cool stuff. Verizon, uh, if you are a Verizon, what do you want to call it, member, or if you have a service through them, you can get one of their free Verizon uh, Google Cardboards, which has the Star Wars theme on it. Uh, actually, I think this is a Sketchfab. No, it's a YouTube. So there you go. Um, so, you, you know, as you know, Google Cardboard has become very prolific um, because, one, it's inexpensive, a couple of lenses and some cardboard. In fact, I've kind of taken that to another extreme, which I'll get to in a moment. But uh, they released like a million of these in the New York Times. Uh, and uh, as we talked about earlier, VRSE had done a video uh, about the plight of the Syrian refugees. And so they were able to actually experience from themselves because it immersed them. And as we saw with the video, it can be, in my opinion, quite compelling and quite immersive. So um, I think it's really a great thing that Google has done and releasing all of their tools. Obviously, I have been using them. But uh, as mentioned, uh, the IM, ILM dot or X labs is the one that's making this. As I mentioned before, I sure hope that they bring out their, as I call it, the environmental awareness, virtual reality systems using the structured sensor as well, because I sure would love to walk around uh, on one of their virtual sets uh, obviously that they use to create this. So um, that's the Star Wars. It's available now. As I showed earlier, the second snippet is out, and they plan to do this every 24 hours, and I think there are like six or seven of them, uh, all up to the, the movie time. So uh, pretty cool. So let's see where we're at now. Um, the other item that I have, I guess that's about it. So I'm going to go and go and give you an update of some things that I have been working on. And if you've been following me on Twitter, you're probably aware of them already. Um, but essentially, I have two products. First of one, first one was uh, I wanted to create something free because, as you know, or you may not know, I started a Kickstarter, and it'll be in the show notes. But essentially, I am. And this is an unfinished version. And I've shown it on the show before. This is the Neody VR Junior. Uh, this is the unfinished white version, which I kind of like. Um, but essentially, it is a shell case that fits over an iPod Touch 6G. And uh, as I said, it's made specifically for kids. The IPD is specifically for kids. It's a lightweight device, uh, as you can see with a handle here. Uh, there will be a, what would you call it, a little aluminum cylinder on the top so that you, with the capacitant touch, will be able to activate uh, Google Cardboard uh, type stuff. So it's pretty neat. As I said, there's a Kickstarter. Sadly, it's not doing as well as I hoped. Um, but uh, my, my goal is really to make 100 of these for hospitals. So even if that doesn't go, I will put in the show notes a link to a PayPal. Uh, if you'd like to donate, you can donate whatever you'd like. My goal is to create 100 of these. Shapeways has already matched uh, what I have already in the, uh, the Kickstarter. Uh, so I'll be able to make 30 of these at least. But my goal, again, was to make 100, distribute these to children's hospitals in the U.S. before Christmas, and then uh, about 50 of those in the U.S. for Christmas, and then after Christmas uh, to around the world. And the reason for that is uh, through... Articles that I read that I covered years ago, actually years, in 2009, that you can use virtual reality to uh, what it called? Uh, distract or cause somebody to feel a particular way uh, being immersed into VR. And this became extremely important with uh, burn victims because it allowed literally for them to cool their skin and distract them so that they could get... Uh, uh, wound or bandage dressing and uh, measurements, which in the case of Children's Hospital at Shriners had to have to do. And so 
I thought, well, it would be a good idea if I could possibly use this technology um, and create something so that children would have some way of either distract themselves or immersing themselves into something else uh, to make their, their suffering a little easier. And this actually worked out at the Shriners. I had given them a pair of the NeoDVR value additions. They put it on a phone and a little boy who had been severely burned, uh, who really was difficult to work with because of the pain, uh, essentially allowed them to work with him because he was immersed with dinosaurs. So, you know, that touched my heart and I'm really wanting to move forward with this. So again, if you have some time, please, uh, uh, you know, donate a little bit and uh, we can make this happen. I'm working with my friend Clint Slaughter, who's a uh, ND uh, surgical uh, doctor out uh no, sorry, an emergency doctor uh, out of local, but he was also the CEO of our local maker space. And we're going to get together and actually put these together with, as I call them, his maker elves, which are some of the kids that they bring in on the weekends to do projects, to be able to put these together, make a little note for the kids. So that is my goal. And, uh, you know, like I said, there will be a link at the top of the uh, this episode that you can donate to PayPal or even better if you would like to go ahead and uh, back me on the Kickstarter. I'd really appreciate that. Okay, but the reason I mention all that is I thought for Thanksgiving, for those people that pledge or actually anybody, I wanted to give something free back on Thanksgiving and I created this. This is called the NeoDVR Paper Edition. And essentially it is uh, about 60, 70 pound cardboard stock. Uh, not even cardboard, just thick paper that uh, you can slip over a phone. Let me put it, I'll use Samsung, like this. And uh, essentially you put the lenses in, I have a little wrapper, I'll show you the two pieces in a minute. And then you have your own little VR experience. So I thought that was kind of cool. Let's see. Thought it would fit on the. There you go. So essentially, it's set up for 45 uh, millimeters focal length, and the lenses are 37 diameter, just like the cardboard too. But obviously, lightweight, foldable, so you can put it in your pocket. I don't have one, uh, which you really can't do with the cardboard. So, like I said, it's free. If you go out the new DVR slash paper editions the pdfs are there that you can download and make yourself they have the instructions on them uh, right here there's about 12 steps that you need to go through to create it literally you cut it out carefully the google cardboard uh, logo is there for you to scan in and then you can scan or print this as an optional this is like a sleeve that fits over the top of it to hold the lenses in. What I suggest is use an adhesive back paper to print this. Print this on as thick a paper or even cardstock. And then uh, if you're using just thick paper, cut out two of them. If you're using cardstock, you only need one of them. And then just wrap that other adhesive end around the lenses once you have them in place. But you can read all that again in the VR slash paper editions. Well, then, you know, I wanted to create some renders and then I got kind of, I don't know, consumed with the idea of creating a 3D printable version of it. So I came up with what I call the Neodi VR Play. And that's a play on an acronym of PLA, which is a 3D print filament. Obviously, those who are listening to the show know what I'm talking about. This is available on Umagine. Just look for Neodi VR Play. And, uh, Currently, I only have the iPhone 6 or 5-inch phone version, which is this here. Um, pretty cool. Um, this has been modified. I will put the modified STLs up, but essentially this used to be fully enclosed like the paper. It isn't anymore. Um, these are a little thicker. So essentially, you wrap this around. There's a little bit of bendability and flexibility in the arms themselves. Um, so now it will actually fit on other phones besides just the iPhone. Uh, so as you can see here, I'm using this on an iPhone, on my phone, a Samsung S4. There you go. 
And uh, what makes this cool, and I'm going to actually give a comparison study here in a moment uh, between three compact, uh, I had designed this in such a way so that it is 3D printable, so you don't need to um, provide any support material. Uh, you essentially print it uh, the way that I have them oriented uh, so that they print flat. That's why they're flat on the inside. So there's a lot of uh, material there to keep it from curling. I would suggest using PLA. I'm using uh, my favorite, which is the Polymax uh, material, which is a PLA with a lot of the uh, advantages of ABS, but still a cornstarch base. So if, one of my recommendations and hopes is that we print this in PLA and not ABS, but you can use whatever you want. It is made to fit the Google Cardboard version 2 compatible lenses, which is 37 millimeter with a 45 focal length. Uh, these are a, a, what do they call it, a bi-convex, but essentially the, the thicker or the rounder part is on the bottom. That's why it's designed in this fashion to protect the bottom so that you don't scratch it. There's a ridge on the top to protect the upper part. But again, this will just slide into your pocket and it is printable and free. So it costs you maybe about 30 cents the material, if that. And the lenses you can buy on uh, Amazon for about $8 or eBay for even less than that. And I will be actually offering a little package um, of the lenses. I don't remember the exact price, but they will be glass lenses. And I have found glass is really the direction you want to go. Uh, less chromatic aberrations around the edges. And in my opinion, it gives a, a sharper image, even at the proper distance from the screen. So that's my idea. Go ahead and try that yourself. And uh, yeah, pretty cool. This is for the iPhone 6 or 5-inch screens. I do have a version that will be up soon for the iPhone 6s plus or 5.5 screens i have tried this both on the iphone 6s which i have right here there you go and essentially i really like this the larger lenses really give you a a better what would you call it more immersive feeling especially with the larger screens um, i'm going to bring up two other products right now one of them, let's see, did I drop it? One of them we talked about before, and I really was excited about this. And I actually uh, purchased a bunch of them, actually given out a lot of them. And I call this the Neody VR Value Edition, but it's actually made by a company called Go4D. It has been Google certified. And essentially, it fits on your phone. I have it either slip it on the bottom or you can actually change the arm so it slips on top. Um, the reason that I have adjusted it uh, is because you can use this with a game controller. Now, these were great when they came out. The only thing that I was disappointed about is the size of the lens. But again, for a smaller screen, five inch or less, this is perfect because really the larger lenses show too much of the edges anyways. Um, so this is perfect for that. They sell for about 19 and I think there's a vendor uh, or a retailer on Amazon, so you can buy these on Amazon. I don't think Prime is offered with it, but uh, you can get these. Um, they're pretty cool. Like I said, they're certified. He's got a few little VR uh, demos uh, that are pretty neat, very interesting, but uh, this is the Go 4D. And then I just found out today uh, the company Homita, if you remember, we've had them on before. I actually designed uh, the original Neo DVR viewer based upon their design with a new uh, faceplate so that you can put in the Neo mount case and the, the occipital structure sensor to create the EAVR headset. And uh, I so I've been working with them, and they had told me at the time that I could, they were coming out with something new. Well, they finally did. And I have a little video that I'm going to show, and this is the Homito.
probably couldn't hear me, so I'll go back over it. So obviously it's a very unique um, design. It fits over the center of your device and then uh, pretty much giving you hands-free uh, ability to work on either side as they're showing there and they're demonstrating some type of augmented reality type game called VR cow abduction, which I guess I should try. Um, but this will be available, and this is the headset we've talked about several times. Very, very nice headset. Again, though, it's made for smaller phones, a six inch. And I have to say that that would be the case for the Homita Mini, which I now have in my hands. Uh, they've given me a uh, production prototype here. This will be available 1212. They didn't tell me a price, but I'm assuming it will be about the same or less than the Go 4D. Um, it is cool. You can flip this in, flip it back out. But as mentioned, it uses the same diameter lens as that on the Go 4D. So it is smaller. So we can actually do a comparison between the two. Um, so above me is a Go 4D and below is the Homino Mini. They, uh, as you can see, the lens sizes are the same. Um, it's a little smaller. They use two different techniques, and I'll show how it works. Um, I'll put this on the Samsung S4. It literally fits in the middle, and it uses a plastic spring-type uh, feedback system that uh, clings to the screen pretty well. I actually was very impressed. Keeps it aligned. Uh, the concern, though, is depending on the size or the... Uh, the width of the screen will depend upon if the lenses themselves are centered, but it looks like this again was geared for a five, five inch or less type phone, which means the iPhone six, or in this case, the S four or the S five or the S six. And, uh, it's actually pretty good, pretty sharp. Um, you know, again, it's what they call, uh, uh an acrylic type lens. And uh, I, again, would consider a glass lens to be a little sharper. But if they keep this below $20, I'm assuming that it might be something like 15 I think this would be a great uh, little stocking stuffer. Um, it is obviously literally something you can pop into your pocket. Uh, I don't know if it will come with a little protective bagger or, or something. I do notice there is no ridge around the lens itself, so it could be easy to scratch them. Uh, I do like the fact that the insides of the lenses are protected. Pretty neat. Um, hats off to you, Homita. I think this is pretty cool. Uh, but again, as mentioned, for a larger screen like the iPhone 6S, um, it, as you can see here, doesn't quite cover the full width of the screen. Uh, so the edges are more prominent in this. So just let you know that if you've got a larger phone, you know, not that I'm going to tout my own system, but you might want to look into 3D printing. I'm going to see if I can find the source to get the cost down. Shapeways now, I can't get this less than 30 bucks. So uh, I think I all parts was like 24. If I can find somebody um, to uh, print this, or actually create a mold for it so we can get it injected, molded. We could probably get it down in the same price range as the others. This is using a larger lens. It works excellent. In fact, it's one of my better viewers now um, for phones. Uh, I have a version that I'm coming out with that will support the structure sensor. Um, that'll be out soon. If you're part of the occipital structure or sensor development team, you may have seen my post last night rest of it will be released this week. So uh, that'll be kind of cool. You'll be able to actually use the EAVR uh, with my system. Not saying you can't with the Go 4D. You can, especially with my Neo mount case. Not with the uh, Mita system though. So obviously variations and variety is good. Uh, they're all less than $20 so, uh, or even free if you are actually not free. But uh, if you buy the lenses and you have a 3D printer, close to free. So lots of choices there. And uh, so that's about it for the VR. And a little plug for myself. Let's see what's coming up in the, uh, the events here. Uh, I don't think there is. Again, things quiet down around the holidays. 
but uh, let's see what we've got. Oh, yeah. So it appears that they have not moved into 2016 yet. So inside 3D printing Shanghai, December 8th through 10th. Next, guess next week. And obviously this weekend, inside 3D printing in Mumbai, which we did talk about last week. Um, so that's about it. Well, again, thank you for listening in. We have one viewer. Hi there, one viewer. Um, please shout shout out if you don't know um, our address here. It's info at allthings3d.net. Um, you can also comment on our YouTube. And uh, you can also donate. As I said, um, our, I have a PayPal set up for donations. I will make one specifically for the Nodi VR, um, as I call it, Nodi VR Junior. There'll be both the basic and extreme version, again, for the Soviet hospitals. But there's also a donation, and I don't know if I have, uh, is it, uh, I want to say Papion? I can't remember the name of it now, but uh, I, mean, I haven't set up an account. But if you like the show, you know, give whatever you can, even 50 cents, 25 cents, maybe even a penny, whatever it is. If you like the show, you like what I cover, I'd appreciate it. But you know what? I almost forgot probably the most important thing. Jeez. Uh, I mentioned I was going to get back to you about the scanners, comparing the ITSY's iPad Air 2 using the structure sensor and the iPad, uh, excuse me, the HP Spectre, and actually it's X2, not X1, RealSense R200. As you can see in the images there, there is a noticeable difference. And uh, I also have a my sketch fab up, and I will bring up the the sketch model, as you can, but as you can see there, first of all, the color tone is off. Uh, her shirt was actually purple. Again, this is my wife. Um, for whatever reason, there seems to be a little bit more distortion uh, in the face, but other than that, they look very similar mesh-wise, but uh, there seems to be more noise, chromatic noise, and it appears to be a little darker. Um, other than that, um, the mesh seems a little bit smoother on the uh, HD Spectre. The other thing that I found noticeably different is that it was about four times slower uh, using the RealSense 200 on the HD Spectre X2. And this was with their latest release. I was a little surprised by that. Uh, it took a little while and also seemed to have some tracking issues. Uh, obviously, either I am pretty used to using the uh, ITSY's 3D on the iPad Air 2, but I found that it much more fluid, much easier to obtain. As far as the time to send up in the cloud, they're about equal and uh, getting your results back. But uh, I'm going to jump to my screen now. So here is the model of the HP Spectre X2. Sorry, it's not the X1, it's the X2. So as you can see, I'll zoom in. There's quite a bit more noise. If you notice, the mesh itself seems smoother. So let's see if we can actually go to, let's go to a wireframe. Uh, let's go to pink. So uh, from what I was told, it's about 50,000 uh, faces for both of them, but it seems a little smoother with the R200. Um, but that may also be that I was a little further back. I found that it was more intuitive, excuse me, intuitive with the iPad as far as adjusting the bounding box. I didn't, either I didn't do it correctly or there wasn't the same kind of function and I didn't know if I was in the right range. It was a little more difficult. One cool feature, and I don't know if this is in the iPad yet, is as I moved away from the object, the object started to turn red. Uh, so they shaded the actual RGB uh, so that it would give you an indication if you were moving too close or too far from the object, which I find extremely important, especially since the camera um, seems to be critical. I'm talking about the RGB camera in this perspective. Um, on the focus of the, the object that you're scanning. So um, let's see, I'm doing all this with shadeless. Turn that off again. 
Uh, but again, if you have a choice and you need a Windows tablet, you can't go wrong because it's built into it. But I actually would prefer the iPad uh, IR2. They told me that the iPad mini, and I have not verified it, uh, 4 will now have that ability. So if you need something light and compact and uh, using the structure sensor, I would highly recommend that. Uh, they have not indicated that they're going to be doing uh, iPhone support yet, even though it is supported by a Cipital, it's not available. And here is the, the iPad Air 2 for comparison. So as it's moving. So I still give the iPad Air 2 or iPad Mini 4 the thumbs up right now. Notice already the... There is less noise, the resolution's better, and for obvious reasons, you're going from 1080p to almost, what, almost 3,000, 4,000 by 3,000. So you're literally almost doubling, quadrupling the amount of resolution uh, in the RGB information. Mesh-wise, uh, seem to have more aberrations, but uh, let's go ahead and turn on the wireframe, but again, Underneath, the wireframe looks almost the same. And this is something that they finally came back to me and said that they have, if enough people, so if you're out there and you use this, uh, if enough people out there, they can uh, go ahead and, uh, uh, where am I going with this? Go ahead and write to them, let them know. They may do a survey for the people who actually own it if they want more polygons. I vote yes for that. I think 50,000 is limiting, especially if you're wanting to print these. If you remember, I have actually talked about this before, and I can again show the difference very quickly. This is something that I created uh, using the ITSY software. This is something that I created using uh, my software. By capturing more faces, polygons, uh, you're able to get more surface detail. Uh, I don't know if you can see the nose definition. It's, let me bring it up closer. Uh, well, it's not focused. But uh, just you can take my word for it. Uh, I have some images out there already. Plus, if you go through my Sketchfab, you can see it yourself. Uh, I went from a million uh, surface or faces versus only 50,000. So you actually get some eye uh, detail as well as lips detail that's not available in the Etsy's. So hopefully they'll make that improvement. Okay, well that's about it. Um, this is Mike Balzer. Uh, Chris had to cut out early, but it was great to have him back on. And I appreciate uh, all of those who are out there listening. And uh, enjoy your weekend, and we'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>